Okay, cool. Everybody can see me okay? Or everybody can see my slide okay? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, great. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, finish up with our flooding uh, uh, discussions today. So we started last week, if you recall, and we were talking about flooding um, <clears throat> uh, sort of generically or riverine, uh, quote unquote, usual flooding and uh, set aside coastal flooding. And so today we're gonna talk about coastal flooding. Um, again, all under the category of flooding, but I think operationally it helps to, to segregate these two, um, these two related, but nevertheless uh, uh, fairly distinct with regards to how they manifest in some of the particular drivers, uh, the, these two factors, these two disasters. And again, as always, interrupt me if you guys have questions or whatever. So just a bit of review from, from what we talked about last time, what is a flood? Obviously, um, we again, we broke down the, the traditional or riparian or stream type of flooding, um, which is usually associated with a water body, classically a river, it could be something else. And uh, the precipitation is such that um, the water overtops some containment structure, be that a bank, edge of a lake, something of that nature, and that's when we experience flooding. Coastal flooding is really specifically stuff that's going on above the high tide line in the immediate coastal zone, and whereas uh, stream flooding is typically freshwater flooding, coastal flooding is typically uh, saltwater or at least brackish water um, flooding. Again, we mentioned that uh, the, the drivers of traditional floods are typically something like uh, the, the melting of snowpacks or a summertime intense thunderstorms, that type of stuff. And we classically get most of our, while we can get it any time of the year, we classically get most flooding in spring and summer. Although in places like California where we're experiencing more so-called atmospheric rivers, um, we are getting more uh, wintertime uh, flooding as well. Coastal floods, which we're going to talk about today, can come from a variety of sources and are, are classically more uh, summer and fall um, in places like Southern California. As with the, our traditional flooding, um, there's two uh, broad uh, components, the meteorological components, meaning the weather, the rainfall, the, the hail, that type of stuff. And then what we humans have done to the landscape to make that hazard more risky and more costly and more dangerous to us. And so even though we're talking about coastal flooding now, the, the same basic uh, uh, bins persist. Okay, so uh, one of the big issues that comes up when we talk about sea level rise, excuse me, it's about coastal flooding is sea level rise. So we're gonna spend a few minutes here talking about sea level rise, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, this data is some data from NOAA. Now I should also say with, with the data I'm gonna show you here in the next many slides, um, they're usually two, three or so years back. And that's pretty common with a lot of our um, large scale sort of data curation data sets. <clears throat> Even for something like global sea level rise, which we now measure with satellites, very well we measured in a variety of ways, but, but one of the main ways now is with satellites. We get that data pretty quickly, we can process it pretty quickly, but we still want to go through some type of QA, QC process to make sure the data are indeed correct, that there isn't some anomaly or some error. And so typically you wait till the end of the year and then um, uh, release the data or, or, or analyze the data as a, as a calendar year. Um, or sometimes if we're talking about something related to um, uh, financial impacts, we might use a fiscal year or something of that nature, but we wait for the, for the year period to go. And then we have a period of preliminary data released and then um, a period of validation and, and quality assurance. And so typically for these things, we get the data a year or two later um, or so. <clears throat> and that's the case right here with global sea level rise. 
Um, I think I could have gotten 2019 in here, but I, I didn't have time. But it, it serves the purpose. Okay, so let's orient ourselves. On the x-axis, we have a time. On the y-axis, we have the um, elevation of the C, and in particular, the deviation of the C from the early 90s. Um, and so uh, the level of the global ocean is zero in 1993 for purposes of this uh, figure. Um, so I, I guess I should say, before we even get going into this, the seas have risen and the seas have fallen throughout the four, more than four billion year history of the earth. Um, and so that's absolutely, absolutely a, a fact, absolutely a case. There's lots of misinformation that's out there um, by people that are intentionally trying to mislead you um, when it comes to issues like sea level rise. The fact remains that we've never experienced the amount of sea level rise, or excuse me, amount of sea level change that we are beginning to experience, we have been and we are beginning to experience uh, more intensely um, in the history of our civilization this fast. So as with most things with climate change, it's, it's not necessarily that we haven't experienced this level of warmth or humidity or whatever it is on earth before, rather it is we've not experienced this level since we've had what we consider modern civilizations. And certainly um, all of the structures, processes, behaviors, expectations, that we've come to um, expect and build into our society, we've never had the changes that are going on here. So when people start to throw out those red herrings about how, oh, sea levels changed before, um, they are ignorant and they are dangerous in terms of those discussions because they, they are intentionally trying to mislead people and misrepresent the situation. This is the situation. So we're gonna talk about the real world here in our class. Okay, so, okay. so um, a lot of, the, the more the data you'll see in the last uh, couple decades um, really go, uh, you'll see um, starting in 1993, we can, we can extend this record far back in time using all kinds of uh, geologic and other uh, signatures. But this is dating from the era of modern sea level rise, very precise satellite measurements. So that's why we're starting in 1993 um, for, for this figure and, and a few others. So um, what our satellites are saying are, is, is the dark gray line, right? The, the, the almost black line there. And this is, and it also, you'll, I'll show you a map in a second, but, but um, it's, it's a non-trivial thing, right? There are, there are physicists, atmospheric specialists that spend their whole career just generating um, figures of this nature, because it really is complex when we talk about the entirety of the earth and when we talk about trying to, to narrow down into one um, subcomponent of, say, the Ventura coastline or something like that. So I don't, I don't mean to trivialize, trivialize this, but I I'm, I'm, want to summarize this stuff for you. Okay, so the, the dark gray line is the trend that we see over time. And the trend is the sea level is getting higher and higher and higher. Why is it doing that? There's several different factors that uh, come into play. Um, uh, with any real complex system, you can't just change one thing. As you change one thing, other elements of the system respond, are dynamic, change. And so that's what we're showing here. So, we're, so these are efforts to try to understand which um, a component of the global climate system is contributing to what's going on. And so with red, we've tried looking at if there was just thermal expansion. Um, as we take um, a substance, in this case water, and, and warm it up, it starts to get right, so it starts to expand a little bit, get warmer, get warmer. Eventually, if, if we make it warm enough, it'll go from liquid form into gaseous form. But it gets, you know, little, so it gets a little bit, a little bit, um, uh, uh, larger volume. That's the red line. The other major thing that's going on is we're melting our glaciers and we're taking 
water in frozen form and putting it into liquid form in the basins of the world's ocean. And that's the, um, that's the uh, uh, various blue uh, lines. Um, and if we take those, those two lines mathematically and add them together, surprise, surprise, we get a very good um, match with what we're seeing in the real world, what we're actually measuring directly with our satellites. And this is a story that we've seen over and over again. In the early days of climate modeling, well, let's call it 70s, um, uh, I should say of, of atmospheric cir global circulation models. So models that try to predict what's going on with the earth as a whole um, at once. Um, th there were a lot of assumptions made. And, and like any model, which is always a simplification of nature, always um, uh, a, a misrepresent, misrepresentation of nature to some degree, there's always some error involved in there. But as we've gone on, we've figured out what the errors are, we've tweaked it, we've refined, we've continually refined these models. And we now have a host of models. Um, some are run by Japan, some are run by UC San Diego, some are run, you know, the, all these different uh, uh, computing centers around the world uh, run these uh, various models. And essentially we get broad agreement um, with them and, and we were constantly refining them. And what we're finding here is we first started making these predictions. People said, oh, that's super scary. Are you sure you're right? You scientist guy that wrote some computer algorithm and, and, and scientist programmer lady that put it in some giant cray computer and push go are you sure you're right and what we're seeing is more and more confirmation over the last couple of decades that indeed these models are correct and if anything what we're finding more on this in, in a few minutes but what we're finding is these models are too conservative right so they're they're under predicting some of the changes or actually under predicting many of the changes that we're witnessing Okay, so, this, so that's what's going on. So an overall, uh, sea level rise increasing. The other thing that's a little bit uh, hard for us to really understand, um, it's hard for me to understand sometimes, is how sea level rise plays out around the global earth. It's not the case that we have a, a cup. Oh, look, here my cup says on thin ice. Look at that, that's, that's, very, uh, that's very appropriate. Um, so it's not the case that this is the earth and this is the ocean and is this as you know a glacier melts or something uh, you know the sea level rise goes up again earth is a very complex system it's 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 dynamic there's various things and so what we find is the rate of sea level rise is variable across the globe just because we're in the pacific ocean doesn't mean um, every coastline, every island is experiencing the same uh, relative amount of sea level rise. And that's what's represented here. So this is a, a, essentially a topographic map of the world's ocean. And we're looking at the change of the surface of the ocean um, from 1993 to 2019. And uh, again, 1993 is when we, we first launched these very precise uh, of satellites that could measure the surface of the ocean. And what we're seeing is some areas, for example, if you look around off the coast of Japan or off the, uh, or a little bit north of the Antarctic Peninsula, what we're seeing is some areas that are really uh, brownish or, 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 or tannish in this image. And that's saying the sea level rise is actually lower there in those regions than it was a couple decades ago. But most of, and then you have places like uh, off our coast, right, which looks fairly pale here, right? So fairly white. Um, that is showing relative, not a huge amount of change for us um, compared to uh, the early 90s now. And then we have other uh, regions of the world's ocean that are, in this case, dark blue that are showing significant increases. So, so the, the rate of increase is much larger than some adjacent areas. What's the scale we're talking about? So if we take these, if we take these um, uh, super dark brownish, tan brownish colors or the super uh, dark blueish colors, 
we're talking 15 to 20 centimeters, and that's on the order of half a foot to, to three quarters of a foot, right? That's, that's a good amount, right? And while, again, a little bit is like a few inches or something, you might be thinking, is that really that big a deal? When you think about the entire planet, that is a big deal, right? There's a lot of momentum in this global system of ours. And so, uh, so the ocean on average is rising, but it's, it's happening in different areas. Why is it happening in different areas? Various factors. So in some areas, it has to do with uh, currents in, in circulation. In some areas, it has to do with, um, for example, as um, uh, sea, uh, uh, sea ice melts and, uh, and is no longer pushing down on the mantle or on the tectonic plate, um, uh, there, you can see rebound. You can actually see, and you can imagine if, if, if you were sitting on someone for a long time and then you got off, that person might kind of uh, stretch and, and, and expand again. So there's various um, uh, geophysical reasons why we get these, these peaks and valleys, et cetera. The net globe sea levels rising. And this has been an issue initially, this was a particular issue and, and caused a lot of confusion from people because back in the day before we had these satellites, how did we know what the sea level rise was? Well, we literally had stakes in the ground or, or, or marks on a pier piling in say San Francisco Bay or Tokyo Harbor or something like that. And so folks would go out every day or, or whenever the frequency was, walk out to the little mark and, and see what the, the water level was, right? And see what the water level was and see what the water level was and see what the water level was. And so, as you can see here, if, if one of our sites happened to be, say off Japan where it's dark blue, people would say, oh my gosh, the sea level is coming up so fast. But if we're in some other areas, right? Like some of these, these paler areas, we might look and say, eh, it's changing, but it's not changing that much, right? And so this global view from satellites has really helped us average out those little pockets and those, and those uh, local uh, scale um, deviations so that we can get a true global average. So uh, sea level is rising, and it, but it is patchy as we go across the earth. Does that make sense, you guys? Sorry, I'm, I'm just talking here. Is that any questions so far? It makes sense to me. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, now, there, there's a, a few flavors of our, um, of our coastal flooding. Um, and one of the, and, and some of these are sort of day in, day out type of issues. Others are episodic associated with a storm or something like that. Nuisance flooding would be something that is, um, uh, not necessarily associated with any one particular major event. It just sort of, you know, happens frequently and on a, a pretty consistent basis. And there's different terms for this. We could use uh, the term um, uh, 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 sunny day flooding or, or, or sunny flooding um, or nuisance flooding, as I've labeled it in this figure. But if we look at um, the U.S., what we see is this the nuisance flooding like this. So the ocean level getting high such that the water is causing problems and flood problems. Um, those events are, depends on where we are on which coast and in which location, but somewhere between three to nine times more common than they were in 1970. So just a sort of, uh, we might call it vanilla flooding is uh, vanilla coastal flooding is happening more frequently. The other thing that's, and probably probably the most, if we had to pick one thing, there's again, many factors, but, but one of the, the clearest problems here with climate change is the conversion of the cryosphere, the frozen parts of the, um, of the planet, turning that cryosphere into part of the hydrosphere. So turning the frozen parts of our planet into liquid water. And that's what we're showing here. And so um, two, wait, two? Yeah, I guess two summers ago, I went on a, a, a trip to Alaska with my family and we saw uh, these you know, really cool glaciers. But when, um, when, not, when we were seeing them, they were cool, but we were having to motor in miles and miles and miles to see the glaciers. Whereas 
John Muir and a party of naturalists that came through in the early, the very end of the 1800s, they saw these glaciers, you know, they were miles farther out to sea. So there's, there's a gazillion different examples you can show here, but this one is uh, Peterson Glacier. This is what it looked like in 1917. And this is the same exact spot in 2005. So um, radically different volume of ice there and these glaciers are retreating. All kinds of issues we have with that in places like um, Nepal uh, and, and, and mountainous regions, that's where they get a lot of their water. So there's gonna be all kinds of water supply issues, but in the context of, of our coastal flooding, this just means there's more liquid now in that cup, in the, in the global basin. Sea level rise um, is uh, in the last decade or so is about double what was happening in the 20th century. Again, sea level is constantly changing. So there is a background level of sea level change. If we humans had been doing nothing, the sea level would slowly be increasing. Uh, the relative sea level would be increasing. For most of the 20th century, it was increasing at somewhere around uh, 1.4 millimeters per year. In the last um, uh, 15, 20 years or so, um, that rate has increased significantly, such that it's basically doubled. And, and we're now losing, or, or now it's, it's now rising, again, if we average everything across everywhere, on the order of about three and a half millimeters per year. Other, uh, other evidence that, that sea level rise is really an issue that's, that's causing problems for us in terms of coastal flooding. Um, various networks of scientists <clears throat> have, have uh, collaborated um, over the years to, to document changes in the earth. The World Glacial Monitoring Service um, has been monitoring the world's glaciers at different places and, with, and so they can calculate an average um, change in, in the world's glaciers. And the rate at which the world's glaciers are melting has increased more than four times the, the background rate. So if we talk about the 1980s, we were melting <clears throat> at the rate of about 171 uh, millimeters uh, per, um, per year. Um, and, and, and so, so ice expands, right? So this is, this is uh, the equivalent volume of water, or the equivalent height of water. In the 1990s, jumps up to 460, 2,500, and the 2010s, we're not done yet because this doesn't include the last year or so, but, but in the 2010s, on the order of 850 millimeters. So things are melting very fast. And if we talk about um, one of the largest stores, the Greenland Ice Sheet, which covers most of the, the island of Greenland, um, that's increased, the loss rate has increased more than seven times. And it's gone from about a loss of about 34 billion tons of ice per year to now or an order of magnitude greater, about 24, about 250 billion tons per year. Um, and if we talk about Antarctica, Antarctica is similar, more similar to the global average where the loss rate is increased by about four times. So we've gone um, from about 51 billion tons per year when I used to go down to Antarctica and, and, and work in Antarctica in the, in the 90s um, to now we're about four times that. We're almost 200 billion tons of uh, uh, ice loss, um, net ice loss per year. Antarctica grows and shrinks every year, but this is net change. Okay, um, so what is, okay, so, so there we go. So that, that, that's all evidence that stuff is going into the global ocean and, and the world's uh, uh, sea levels are changing. That's all true. That's all right now. That's all happened. We know this is all fact. The question now is, okay, now as we talk about trying to manage flood, trying to predict flood risk, what's gonna happen in the future? So we need to start forecasting. And here's where we start to get into you know, assumptions and are we going to control our emissions? Are we going to reduce airplane trips? All these, all these uh, types of things. And all of these models, um, again, first are trying to predict what's going on with the earth and we make some assumptions. 
and we take old data and we train the model. So we take, say, the data from 1980 to 2000 and we reset the model to 1980 and we say, ready, set, go. And we see uh, if, it, if the model can predict, correctly predict what happened between 1980 and 2000. And so we use this historic data to, to tweak, confirm, uh, you know, adjust and, and make sure our, our uh, models are working. So that's the sort of physics of the planet working. But when we start to get into um, future casting, there's that aspect, there's what's the, you know, physically happened, but there's also all the choices that you and I make and the policy decisions we make as a global community. And so that's why it gets, it gets really wacky, right? So, so the error here is coming mostly from um, our different drivers of the system. Um, will we you know, reduce carbon emissions by X amount or will we not, et cetera? And so we, what we get amongst this global mix of models is a range. And so the range will, will go from a relatively um, predicted small amount of change to a really relatively high amount of change. And in the context of sea level rise, we're talking about um, uh, how much more or, 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 or the rate of increase of that sea level rise. Um, yeah, so uh, well, let, me, let me ask you guys this question. So we have a bunch of models, right? And they're, they're different assumptions. So some are, in this case, red, some are, uh, I don't know what that is, mustard colors, some are green, some are blue, et cetera. How would you guys go about um, deciding what we should do uh, once we have this palette of potential model responses? What do you guys unmute and, and give me a couple ideas what you might, how you might approach that? Can you repeat the question? Data. Yeah, so the question is, so, so in general, let's say you guys are part of the IPCC or you're part of a coastal flooding working group or something, and, uh, and the scientists came up to you, the modelers came up to you and gave, said, okay, we've been running all these different models. Here's, here are all our, our different possible predictions as illustrated here in this, this figure. So some are, some are major change, some are not that much change, some are in the middle change, what approach would you guys take to to going forward? Are you gonna are you gonna average things? Are you gonna are you gonna look at one end, look at the other end? What are you guys gonna do? I personally would err on the side of caution and pretend that things are going the extreme route, but I think most politicians are gonna do the opposite of that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so uh, you know, hey, I wanna I wanna hedge my bets and so I wanna I'm, I'm worried that we only have one earth and I don't want to gamble on it. So I want to err on the side of making sure we don't tweak it too much. Okay, so that's one possibility. Anybody else? Um, probably like study and go more into detail like in between each increase and then from like the most increase from the least increase. Just okay, so, so, so tell me more like that. So Holly, so you're, you're just gonna say, um, Here's one end, here's the other end. Let's sort of average them or let's look at- No, just kind of look more into them. Like why is, cause it's kind of like consistent as it goes up right there. And okay. just like go into more detail of how to like prevent it from going up really. Okay, okay. Any other, anybody else have any other uh, ideas or suggestions? I have a quick question. Um, what's the, is there a difference between a model and a projection? No. Okay. Well, I mean, well, Okay, okay, I guess technically a model is the actual thing, is, is the math that's behind it. And then the projection or the prediction is, is the output from the model. But, but no, there, there's no real effective difference between those, th those things in practice. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we have, we have a vote for go extreme and we have a vote for kind of go mid-range somewhere. Do we have any other ideas or suggestions? I guess this isn't really a suggestion, but I would just kind of want to know, like, what, uh, like, looking at the track that we have been on and then looking at all the different options of possible outcomes, like, what would cause it to go to the extreme? What would keep it low? Yeah. You know, like, what the, the different factors we could 
that they would be, you know? Totally, totally. So um, a great example, how are we doing on time? So a great example of this, maybe we'll, we, we can even do this when we take a pause here. Um, uh, a great example is the COVID, actually, let me, let me see if I can show you guys this. So let's see if I can find it here on the fly. Um, it's uh, University of Washington um, COVID-19 Center for I probably got that wrong. Um, uh, this one? Uh, this one. Okay, so, so this is essentially the same question that we have right now with regards to um, COVID. And so um, this is the um, uh, research institute in, in Seattle that has generated these um, uh, models. So this is this is global. Let's look at let's look at uh, let's look at us. Let's look at where are we? Let's look at us. Okay. Okay. So um, this is uh, similar, right? We're, I mean, a different model, a different system. We're not talking about the climate or sea level rise. We're talking about COVID-19 infections, but, but from the perspective of the question I asked you guys, which is model, don't know the future, all the different outputs um, have a, a different assumption associated with them. So what these guys are doing is these guys have gone back um, and just like with climate, once the reality happens, once October 1st happens, they actually put the real data in there. So they say, this is, this is the value that, that um, the amount of infections or deaths or whatever uh, were on that uh, particular day. And so they're constantly adjusting the model. And so we get to this part. So, so right here between um, the last couple of days and now, there's a little bit of lag because they don't have the, the verified data. But, but here's today. And then as we go forward in the future, you'll see there's some extreme predictions. There's the red line that goes up. There's, there's a, a more conservative line that's green. And there's a, a maroon uh, line that's sort of uh, what, what they think is the likely outcome. And, and all of these things assume different uh, things. So the green assumes that everybody wears masks all the time um, and so on and so forth. And so, so this is exactly the same question as, um, as I asked you, which is, okay, so here's the data. We know what's happening and we've, we've been adjusting our models. We go, now we have the model. And from here on out, what, you know, what are we going to do? And so uh, was it Sabrina, I can't remember, was it Caitlin or Sabrina? I can't remember who asked that, but somebody said, hey, so how have our models done? And note, right here in this first part, uh, you know, like tomorrow or the next day or this week even, you won't really see much of a difference between um, the red line, you know, uh, uh, extreme prediction versus conservative prediction, right? And so it's gonna take some time. So it's going to take some amount of time, weeks, months, in the case of the climate system, years possibly, for us to really be able to distinguish which of those trajectories are we on. So um, when we have done that um, with our climate system, um, we are uh, usually uh, finding that our, our uh, middle of the road um, predictions or interpretations are not uh, are not the right ones. <clears throat> so, um, so how we how we've approached this is basically the way Holly has approached this. Now. Um, wasn't really going to talk about this, but but it's it's all good. We're, we're you guys asked the questions, so I'll answer it. Which is um, the way this has progressed is um, the IPCC, the Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is an independent body, but is but but collaborates with the UN. 
scientists all around the world from different, all different countries and different specialties, et cetera, um, are constantly working on different predictions and different interpretations and different scenarios for what's going on. At the core of this are these global climate models. And so these global climate models have all these outputs. When, when we talk about what actually is gonna happen in California or Bangladesh or whatever, what we essentially do is we take those global models for what we think the planet is gonna do and we downsample or, or we downscale, right? And we, 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 we try to take that, that big data set and boil it down to relevance for the farmer, for the businessman, for the, for the homeowner, whatever. A non-trivial thing because um, while it'd be great if we could model every one square meter or cubic meter of the earth, that's a lot of computing power. power. So usually these models use the spatial resolution is larger on the order of you know, many miles by many miles. So it's hard to sort of say what's happening in Camarillo. So that's how we started. And then in the last uh, decade or two, there's been a lot of focus on how do we downscale those global data and those global model outputs to, make, to be able to make relevant guidance for local officials and communities, et cetera. Um, and so, so that's the process. Um, uh, the other thing to say is um, when our current consensus st started to come around with climate change, because there's so many deniers and, and people that are actively misleading and putting out incorrect statements, um, essentially this is what happened. Um, we had this range and, we've, and, and some people were saying, oh my gosh, we're gonna be on the red trajectory, right? And uh, when we first got global buy-in for the planet in terms of what the consensus was, um, this was uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, or early 2000s, President George W. Bush, not a huge fan or believer in climate change. Uh, Putin in Russia, not a huge believer in climate change or reality of any kind. Um, uh, uh, the government of India that wasn't too, that for various political reasons didn't want to deal with uh, emissions and, and didn't feel they could deal with emissions and so on and so forth. So we had this global um, consensus. Now, the important thing to say is with the IPCC, this is a consensus body, right? So it isn't that we sit there and vote and if 51% and if of, the, of the body say, we're going with the red model, we'll go with the red model. No, it's, it's a consensus. If countries don't agree, they will not sign off on the, on the um, document or on the, on the product, right? And so, um, and similarly for the, the Kyoto Protocol, right? If, if, if a country didn't wanna sign it, they would say we're walking away. So the challenge is how do we take science that, that's a bit um, vague or, or not vague is not right, um, uh, we can't precisely predict the exact future, right? So we, we have a range of options. Mix that with the real politics of, of the real world, and what do we do? And so the answer was we took a consensus, so-called consensus output. So we took sort of the approach that Holly suggested. So, so we took the green level, right? So there was essentially saying, wow, red sounds really scary, right? And red might scare people off. And not every model predicts red also. Only some of the models predict red. Some of the models predict low. Mm, that seems like that might not, that might be a problem. So, so we went with the inter, with, with the sort of middle of the road type of results, right? And so this is the, these are the results that Russia signed off on, that China signed off on, that the US signed off on, that Australia signed off on. So it was, it was something of a political coup to, to get the buy-in here onto the, the intermediary path. And we've mostly stuck with that. So if you look at all different play, ways this plays out, wildfires, whatever, the modeling effort, we have a range and we usually pick the middle of the road value. That's not how science works, right? We don't, we don't do a bunch of models and go, ah, okay, we'll just pick the middle, right? We actually test hypotheses and we, and we run stuff. And so um, again, 
given that we, for, for political reasons and consensus reasons, have historically taken the middle of the road prediction pathway, um, what, we're, what we're finding is that now in the decade or two since we made, we, we sort of committed to that type of an approach, now we understand that many of those predictions were too conservative, that the ice and virtually everything, ice rate is happening faster than we predicted, um, uh, increase of, of storm uh, frequency happening faster than we predicted, um, all these things. Um, and, that, and that's not to say the people that made the, the middle of the road prediction were stupid or wrong or whatever, but, but that's how things have played out. And so um, where this gets uh, uh, important is have a look at what these models say right here. Okay, so these, these, this model, th th this is from a publication in 2017, which I think the models came from, I think, 2014, right? So here's, here's a change in sea level, meters, right? So, so if we talk about 2100, which is usually a convenient, you'll hear 2050. Sometimes you'll hear 2070, um, but the most common you'll hear is 2050 and 2100. Why, why those? Because they're nice numbers that we can wrap our head around and, and, and they seem a bit far away, right? So we feel like we have time to adapt to be more resilient in terms of our coastal flood structures we don't wanna install or, or what have you. Um, and what we see here is the conservative prediction of how much is the sea going to rise is on the order of uh, you know, a quarter of a meter, right? That's not that much. Our intermediary uh, levels are somewhere around a meter, meter and a half, right? So three, four-ish feet, somewhere around there. Extreme predictions on this model, they're actually more extreme than this, but, but, the, but the extreme models as represented here by this NOAA publication, um, we're talking two and a half uh, meters, right? So that's you know taller than me. And, um, and that seems kind of scary, right? Uh, especially when we talk about uh, how, how low lying a lot of our coastal areas are in the US and in places like Southeast Asia. So, um, so, so we've, we've, taken this, we've taken this middle of the road. And once we took this sort of global consensus of the middle of the road, as we then went and down sampled these, these models and made them more uh, practical, more useful tools for policymakers, citizens, et cetera, business leaders, um, we imported that that convention, right? So for California, in the is, oh, sorry, does that make sense, you guys? Is, are we cool with that? Is that that sort of an overview of uh, yeah, that makes sense. Qualitatively, an yeah. overview of, of sea level rise models. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Again, interrupt me if if I'm something doesn't make sense or I'm I'm going too fast. Okay. Uh, so now let's talk about what's going on in California. So, so we've taken these global models and now we're gonna downsample these so that they have some relevance to us. Um, the, the prediction was basically three to three and a half feet, somewhere in that order of magnitude um, of sea level rise for California. So starting the early 2000s, these were the guidance documents that came out. So when we talked about generating tools for planners, for uh, realtors or whoever, that's by and large what we used. So we used the assumption that the sea was going to go up a meter or so uh, by 2100. Um, uh, and, that's, and so that's, how, that's where we were for a while. And then in 2017, this document came out, which is an update on the sea, on sea level rise in the state of California. And uh, we, took, we began to take a different tact here. So whereas before, um, and, and again, let's remember most of the people that are dealing with coastal flooding, they're not, they're not environmental scientists like you or me, right? They're, they're Joe Blow. They're, they're the farmer. They're the, what are, they, don't, they don't have time to spend days and days and weeks getting into the minutia of stuff. They just want to know, just like a rain forecast, hey, is it going to rain tomorrow or not? Hey, how much is the sea level going to, you know, going to come up or not? So, um, so this is not, I'm not saying that this was uh, nefarious or this is bad. We need to have some easily understood tools. And at some point you have to make a decision. And if we just put, well, we have this huge variance up here, that's not gonna, that, that won't help 
most people that need a concrete answer to make concrete decisions. So, so we picked that. And so for the early 2000s, early, 2100, uh, early uh, 2010s and, and teens, uh, this is what we were using. And so a lot of those tools that is, you see when we started playing with some of these uh, simulators, um, that's what's parametrizing them. Then in 2017, this study came out, which said, uh, yeah, okay, but it actually seems like it's probably going to be worse than that. And so um, rather than saying every jurisdiction, and, and, and so what's worse? So, so it seemed to suggest that um, much more likely um, would be something on the, or I should, let me say that, much more likely, that, that's a loaded term. Um, uh, the, the uncertainty is large, and um, we certainly appear to be on track to be hitting that meter, meter and a half level, or significantly exceeding it. So then a new, so this report uh, began to make people a little bit more comfortable with talking about larger sea level rise along the California coast on the order of perhaps seven feet, okay? So, so about two meters or so, two meters or more. Uh, interesting though, here the guidance doesn't say, you know, Laguna Beach, San Francisco, whatever, you, you all should plan for seven feet. It says, here is the range. And so just like, I forget who, somebody chimed this in earlier, um, but just like you guys said is, well, what does your community feel comfortable with, right? How much risk, how risk averse are you? And if you're, uh, if you're kind of like to go to Vegas and play the craps, maybe you can stick with the, the meter and a half sea level rise. But if you're worried, if you have your hospital right next to the coast or your nuclear power plant right next to the coast or something like that, maybe we don't wanna gamble that we're hopefully gonna just get it right. And so those communities have now been given the green light to use other, um, other sea level rise uh, uh, levels. And so, so that's where we are now. So right now, each jurisdiction is a, or each uh, local area of the state can essentially choose um, the level they want. Now, remember the other part of this. So we've been talking about this from, from the science scientist perspective, right? That, that uh, sea level rise is gonna go up this much and it's gonna make more flooding and all this and that, right? But the response we've not talked about, right? The response was, so we're gonna have to move that nuclear plant. Okay, who's gonna pay for that, right? Or we're gonna have to um, uh, do something for these communities that are gonna be flooded or this uh, a toxic dump site that's gonna be flooded, right? So um, the other reason why people uh, understandably gravitate more towards the middle things here is because that's less scary and that's less costly, and that's a left, less heavy lift from a policy standpoint, and that's, that's less um, uh, damage that we have to incur, right? Fiscally, politically, socially. Um, but the question is, uh, you know, we're, we're guessing as to what, how the plan is evolving. And so it, it um, uh, totally understandable that people are afraid of the costs, but, that doesn't mean that those costs won't exist, but that's sort of the debate that we're in right now with coastal flooding is, is where are we falling out on this perspective? And this report was one of the opening salvos to help us have a more significant conversation about risk in the state. And now it's not the seven, the, you know, the two meter high sea level rise is not required that every jurisdiction has to deploy that, but now, you're allowed to if your community supports that. The other thing to remember is if you go ahead and you say, yeah, I'm gonna put in, we're gonna, we're gonna model what's gonna happen to Dana Point or San Clemente or whatever um, with two meters rise, um, your, your public might not like you, <laughs> right? And they might vote you out of office and then, and then reverse some of these things. So this, this is a non-trivial issue, um, but, uh, but suffice it to say, this 2017 report has given us uh, the um, opportunity to look more robustly at uh, sea level rise flooding. And with that, I think we'll take a quick, unless there's questions, we'll take our, our first little break here. Uh, does anybody have questions before I, before I pause this? No, okay, great. So why don't we um, pause right now? We'll take a 10 minute break. 
I'll pause the recording and we will um, uh, come back and uh, keep chatting in um, exactly 10 minutes. I'll start my timer. Ready, set, go. That. That. Okay. Okay. Everybody, everybody okay? Everybody can see my slides? So that, that, that's essentially where we are now with California in, in the sense that um, we are, some jurisdictions are beginning to move more towards the um, more uh, um, higher sea level rise predictions and beginning to factor that into planning and, and response to uh, coastal flooding. In general, these climate models broadly writ suggests uh, that we're gonna have warmer temperatures, we're gonna have more sea level rise. Also with regards to coastal flooding, we are likely to have a reduced sediment supply, at least a changed sediment supply in our littoral cells. And as a consequence, uh, fewer and less wide sandy beaches. So our sandy beaches were, which are uh, the transition between um, in much of the state, there's, we also have rocky beaches and rocky interfaces, but, but in places like Southern California here, um, sandy beaches are really the thing that is between the home, between PCH, uh, uh, the park, what have you, and the ocean. Those are almost certainly going to be um, reduced. The question is, are, gonna, are they gonna be, be reduced a little bit or a lot? Um, we're also experiencing changes to our hydrological cycle, which will also feed back into that. Um, where, where it's, it's unclear exactly what, uh, wh how wildfires are increasing um, world with more burning going on, how that's gonna impact our coastal zone, but it may well have some significant impacts. Um, the increased atmospheric river, the increased sort of when it rains, dumping huge amounts of rain um, is also going to foster coastal erosion, the, the, the crumbling of, of sea cliffs and bluffs and things of that nature. <clears throat> and then the, another factor that we don't typically think about, but one that may well have some um, significant consequences to coastal flooding and act to, to reduce some of the barriers to flooding um, are uh, other knock-on effects of uh, climate change, and that is increased ocean acidification, which will, which is making it harder for things like oysters and oyster beds to form. It makes it harder for little planktonic um, uh, baby oysters out in the water column to metamorphose and create a shell, so that they could then um, eventually land on a on a reef and become an adult oyster. And those adult oysters form essentially rocky rocky reefs that help buffer storm surge and things of that nature. Um, those are becoming, um, will be, be, be becoming rarer. And then a related thing, which is this growing phenomenon of, of so-called marine heat waves, where the ocean water is abnormally warm. That leads to um, all kinds of stuff. We've seen massive die-offs with marine mammals that are starving and, and shorebirds and things of that nature. So, so these various critters are important maintainers, um, a buffer, helping us buffer um, some of the, the strongest storm surge and things like that um, and, and, and reduce to an extent the amount of coastal flooding that we see. Those critters are uh, increasingly being threatened by climate change. So all the stuff is coming together to suggest that we are likely to see more coastal flooding as we go on into the future. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, so one thing I just put in here to make sure that we were clear when, when you're reading, doing some of the readings, et cetera, we often hear uh, references to spring tides. I'm gonna play a couple of videos for you in a second. <clears throat> references to, to spring tides. And just to be clear, that's not, when we say those, we're not um, necessarily referring to tides in the springtime of the year, but rather we're talking about the, the, the range, the tidal range, how much the 
seed typically goes up and how much the seed typically goes down. On our parts of the coast, we have what's called a mixed semi-diurnal tide, which means we have two, typically in a day, we have two high tides and two low tides. And those are typically different. So there's a higher high and a lower high and a lower low and, and et cetera. And so, so for each month, our tides don't run on a calendar month, they run on a lunar month. And when the sun and moon align and are, are, are in the same plane, that's where we get the greatest pull of the, of the um, uh, waters of the earth. And that's where we get, as, as we spin underneath those waters, as, as the, the critters that are attached to the rocks on Earth, that's how we perceive um, uh, high tides and low tides. So when we say spring tides, we mean the tides for that month, the highest of the high tides of that month. Here in California, um, our tides are significant, not as significant as some places in the world, the Bay of Fundy, et cetera, but we have uh, you know, some pretty decent tidal ranges. So we can go from a high tide to a low tide. We could, the, the tides could change, you know, one to two meters. Whereas in our friends in Louisiana or in um, Florida, they might see, you know, yay amount of, of tidal range over the course of a, of a, you know, typical tidal cycle. So we have some decent uh, tides here in California. Um, what is coastal flooding? Wow, well, yes, yeah, so, so, so how does it actually manifest? With all these things I've just talked about, sea level rise, et cetera, um, we have a couple different flavors. We have the daily tides, um, and, and this would be the stuff that just goes on day in, day out. If we were to have something that were to change, if we were to have some rains, let's say, that went into a constrained bay like San Francisco Bay or maybe San Pedro Harbor or something of that nature, um, just the fact that we have the daily tides going up and down, that could be enough, that extra water could be enough to push us into flooding. Or if, if your infrastructure is subsiding, if, you're, if you're, your house or your pier is slowly sinking into the sediment, again, just the regular tidal action can expose you to flooding. Uh, the next thing is to the right, these would be king tides. And so king tides, um, not, not a super technical term, but um, what we're talking about here are sort of the highest spring tides. And so these are the, the, the few tides of the year that are really, really strong and really, really high. And so this, somewhere between daily tides and king tides are that what, what um, I labeled in that last slide nuisance flooding which is more of the kind of vanilla flooding, the kind of day in, day out, we expect this to happen, we're sure. So, so if we have a pier or a parking lot, let's say, that is at elevation X, uh, and we know that, that king tides are higher than that, you know, guaranteed that infrastructure will flood on at least you know, a few times of the year, right? Um, so that would be the, the more regular, um, uh, in and out flooding. Then we go on to the, the two guys on the bottom. And so this, the, these are more episodic. These are things that don't necessarily happen every single year. The first is El Nino. We've already touched on El Nino. Um, basically this seven to 11 year uh, periodicity of uh, changed storm frequency in our part of the world in Southern California Recall when we have an El Nino phenomenon, we get more intense rains. So an El Nino year is a wetter than quote unquote normal year. And so those El Nino conditions will act to exacerbate coastal flooding. There'll be more water, there'll be more storms, et cetera. And we will get um, uh, areas, definitely the daily places that, that would get exposed with flooding with a daily tide or king tides would absolutely get flooded and in additional areas as well. And the fourth one I'm showing you here are when we have um, episodic storms. And so um, the classic case here would be something like hurricanes. We don't typically think about hurricanes striking Southern California. We think of that as something that would strike uh, Florida, Louisiana, the Texas coast, something of that nature. And absolutely, absolutely that's where um, we most frequently get these types of cyclonic uh, weather events. 
but we actually get um, uh, hurricanes in Baja, California, right? So, so just south of us, we routinely get um, hurricanes. And with climate change, it's more likely that some of these hurricanes will spin off from that normal area and smack us here in Southern California. Indeed, um, essentially that happened in the early part of the 1900s and the 1920s and destroyed a pier that used to exist off of Magoo Lagoon. It used to be a fishing pier where the public could go fish uh, uh, for uh, uh, giant sea bass and things of that nature. So we have occasionally had um, hurricanes or tropical storms strike us here. And as we go into the future, we're gonna get more of those. But coastal storms can induce flooding and the storm doesn't have to be a hurricane, even though that's the classic example. Now, um, daily tides, water going up, going down. King tides, water going up, kind of staying up for a little bit longer, maybe and a little bit higher, maybe. El Nino, kind of more rain pushing it up. Um, one of the things about coastal storms is different than these other, uh, types of floodings, which is um, the introduction of so-called storm surge. So storm surge is, is a very um, important phenomenon that you guys understand in terms of disasters, and it's where a huge amount of the damage associated with hurricanes in coastal areas um, uh, occurs, or, 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 or the, the factor that induces damage. So what do we mean by, um, uh, actually, Let's go to this one first. Okay, uh, never mind. Okay, so sorry. I'll, I'll, before we talk about that, I, I put in this this uh, little news story about sunny day flooding. So in this case, we're essentially talking about um, daily tides or king tides. Um, the other thing that I haven't mentioned here, we, we focused on sea level rise, and that's going on. But another aspect that can be happening as well is um, the uh, the area that we're standing on could also be subsiding. So usually what we're talking about here is those satellites measure absolute sea level. Um, usually what we talk about is relative sea level rise. And so that um, accounts for if, if our tectonic plate is sinking or, our, or, our, um, or we're pumping out so much water out of our coastal plain that, that the, the ground is starting to shrink, right? So we're talking about relative sea level rise. And so with sunny day flooding, the idea here is these top two panels, no El Nino storms, no, no hurricanes, just, just a nice so-called sunny day. So middle of summer, let's say, or a nice spring day, and it's all sunny, there's no wind, but yet we're experiencing coastal flooding. And so this is an example of that from uh, the, uh, the epicenter of this, the, the poster child of this, of coastal flooding for, for the US, which is Florida. So let me play this and make sure you guys can hear this. I guess I'm not allowed to skip my ads. Streets have been underwater for more than a month, and families are fed up. Local tenders reporter Hatzel Vela joins us live. Hatzel, what's the solution to all this? Well, that's a solution that they're still trying to figure out the solution between the county and residents who live here. Short term, long term, they still don't know. But I can tell you this water that's been lingering here for 45 days, some residents say, keeps them from leaving their homes and they're simply frustrated. It is fall in Key Largo, months where residents expect flooding, but not for this long. Today is day 45. This is the new normal, it seems. So 45 days, I can't imagine. No, no. Emily Stewart gives us a tour of the Still Right Point subdivision. This is probably one of the deepest parts of the flooding. There's about 215 homes here. It is surrounded by canals between US-1 and the Florida Bay. That's become the way of life that all of us feel like we're hostaged in here. Our hurricane specialist, Brian Norcross, explains why it's happening. We had a huge hurricane, Lorenzo, which was pushing back on the Gulf Stream, kind of slowed it down. That means the Gulf Stream waters that are right near the Keys pile up and the water has to go somewhere. He says the tide has been running nearly a foot and a half above normal, the, the perfect storm. Trips outside the neighborhood are pre-planned. Folks who live here want to lessen the possible damage to their cars from the seawater. George Smythe has to wash his car daily, fearful the salt water will rust and destroy it. We met with several residents 
to say Monroe County hasn't done enough since they started addressing the issue in 2012. The cost effective solution would be just to basically to raise the road up by putting asphalt on it. Monroe County officials say there really isn't a short term solution aside from storm drain enhancements and cleaning. They want a long term fix. So right now we're doing a four point seven million dollar study to know exactly how bad the problem is and what needs to be done to fix the problem. Back out live, you can see some residents washing their cars after driving through the salt water. This is even affecting law enforcement. That's because Monroe County Sheriff is telling us that they're not doing routine patrol because they're fearful of what damages the water will cause to their vehicles. They are still, of course, doing emergency calls if that were the case here in this neighborhood. For now, reporting live in Key Largo, I'm Hal Sovella, local. Okay, so that's one example of uh, some some you know no storm around us, and we're just getting this uh, uh, sea level rise. The next thing I want to image for you guys is uh, the storm surge, and uh, the Weather Channel started doing this a couple of years ago, and they got a lot of uh, cool press, and I think rightly so. It was pretty neat. So rather than to, rather than doing um, a typical uh, you know oh my gosh the wind is blowing. They actually used some computer animation and tried to visualize for people what the storm surge looks like. Now, before we look at this, what I want to explain to you guys is that storm surge, when we hear that term, if we've not experienced, if we've not been in a hurricane or something like that, it's easy to misinterpret what it is. We we hear storm surge and we think surge, you know, like 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 we're playing in the pool, <clears throat> playing in the pool, and we kind of like you know go like that with with our hands, and a, and a wave kind of crashes over. That's not this. What we're talking about is uh, large weather systems, sometimes tens and tens of miles wide or potentially even hundreds of miles wide are blowing. And again, you can imagine if we're in our bathtub and you have a hairdryer, don't kill yourself, don't, don't put it underwater, but if you blow that hairdryer, right, the water is gonna tend to pile up just like we talked about with, um, uh, the El Nino in, in, in the Pacific Basin. Same thing, piling up, piling up, piling up. But now that water is going to pile, pile, pile. The other thing to think about is much of the world that tends to have more problems with storm surge is not like us. It's not like California. It is like Bangladesh. It is like Florida. It is like the Carolinas. Very, 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 very pancakey, flat country. No relief. Very, very flat. And so <clears throat> the combination of having a flat landscape, uh, you know, whereas we have, you know, Pacific Coast Highway and stuff, and we have Big Sur Coast, and we have the Santa Monica Mountains, we have this up-down coast. Much of these places have a flat coast. And then we're going to be piling up this water. So, so let's take a look and see... Um, uh, how these guys are trying to warn people about the coming storm surge in this particular storm. Extremely dangerous Hurricane Florence continues to close in on the Southeast United States, and it will carry with it significant storm surge and life-threatening inundation. Let's look at these maps, for example, created by the National Hurricane Center to give us almost a block-by-block -block assessment of how much water rise you can expect of normally dry ground. This, for example, over southeastern North Carolina in Beaufort and Moorhead City. These are some locations that we think will get significant storm surge. Now, these areas shaded in yellow and orange can expect water rises of six, maybe even nine feet. That's going to flood many of these locations downtown. But it's more than that because this is not just going to be a coastal phenomenon. We know that the storm surge with Florence is going to continue inland and surge many miles. For example, in Newport, North Carolina, significant inundation, water rises above nine feet nearby, and even farther west than that, the storm surge will find its way well inland. So let's now have a look at what that might be like. For example, we know Florence is going to bring one to three feet of inundation across many locations. That certainly is enough to knock you off your feet. It can definitely stall cars out and even carry cars away and certainly flood many of the lower levels of structures. But we know Florence is also gonna bring water rises well above that, perhaps up to six feet. Now, six feet of water, imagine that. That carries large objects in it. 
like cars, for example, that can act like battery rams and enhance the damage that would otherwise be. And also, we know that can flood the lower levels of any structure. We also know that Florence is going to carry with it lightning storm surge well above that, perhaps nine, ten feet, maybe more. That will totally cover up one story buildings and structures, leaving them underwater and certainly pose a risk to many. There are very few places that are safe when the water rises this high. So please follow the advice of your local officials and heed the evacuation warnings. And of course, stay updated on all the latest comments. I can't quit this thing. Sorry, guys. Check my... out this blizzard. I am up in the clouds, way up, as a matter of fact. About 6,500 feet. It's a long way down there. Snow's flying all over the place. And oh, wait for it. I lost my mouse. Where was my mouse? I just get myself in these situations. We'll save that for another second. All right, listen. This is a monster winter storm, but there's a wrinkle in the forecast. Let's take this down. Ah, yes, the heart of summer and so many things to enjoy. Grilling out, going to the pool, and definitely ice cream to keep you cool on a hot day. That's what I'm talking about. But summer also brings thunderstorm. Okay. Sorry, guys. I don't know why I couldn't. Uh, you, YouTube wanted to take, take over my screen. I don't know. Those crazy YouTubers. Okay. Um, so, uh, so storm surge. Um, th that's a realistic representation. So it's not a wave that comes in. Depending on the storm and the speed of the storm, the water can start to, to rise hours and hours and hours before the, the main storm arrives uh, to your, the coastal site. And that elevated water could stay elevated for hours and hours. So when Katrina made landfall in places where we work, um, it, it made a new record for storm surge, 31 feet in this one point in Mississippi that was measured. So th the water, 31 feet, and again, 31 feet in California is crazy. 31 feet in an area where there is, you know, the, uh, the, the mountain place people call the mountain is five feet above sea level. There is literally nowhere to go and everything disappears. And so, um, uh, obviously, the, the, the danger to infrastructure, the danger to human lives, all that stuff is huge. Um, and what we've primarily done in the coastal zone, as with other flooding situations, is make ourselves more vulnerable to storm surge by removing natural vegetation, transforming uh, natural landscapes, vegetation, uh, 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 sand dunes, things of that nature that would act to, to slow down or act as something of a speed bump to a, a storm surge. So more typically now, our storm surges have a free reign to come right into our uh, town, our city, our home, et cetera. So storm surge is a real problem, and it's very real, and it can be very deadly. Um, questions about that? Questions about uh, Sunday day flooding, storm surge, the, these, these flavors of flooding that happen in the coastal zone? How long do people usually have as a warning to, to get out before? Oh, I great question. I mean, in the U.S., um, uh, usually a good amount of time. Um, so uh, uh, usually you have days. And so you saw now, and so we're getting better and better with the predictions. And so you saw in that case where the hurricane was coming in, the National Hurricane Center actually generated um, um, area-specific predictions of flooding and, and what the depths of the floodwaters could well be. Really good. And so... Um, we have pretty darn good estimates. The issues, we'll talk about this when we get to hurricanes, but the issue is um, we're not entirely sure where the hurricane will land because there's because like anything else, there's, there's vagaries and things. And so we generate what's called a cone of uncertainty. And so uh, just like with all these other models, right when we go out one day out or one hour out, we're pretty sure where it's going and the intensity of the storm. But as we go 
two days out, three days out, whatever, there are more variabil there's more variability. But certainly once we're a couple days away from making landfall in the US at least, we have pretty darn good warnings and, and very clear predictions in most of the, um, at least in areas we have large um, um, uh, urbanization we have some really good models now. And that, and that is to really help inform people, one, to send to the local leaders, the politicians and the county supervisors and people of that nature, and, and county EMS people that, that activate the emergency response plans and the evacuation plans and to induce people to get out as soon as possible. Um, but then also to help stage for the response. So, oh my gosh, these guys are really probably gonna be stuck. We're not gonna be able to get everybody out. So let's get the National Guard ready to go in in the wake in these areas that are the most likely to flood are probably gonna need the most help, that kind of stuff. So, so you usually have at least days, in some cases, even more, uh, more um, uh, lead time. Cool, other questions? I have one more video to show you guys and then we'll, we'll get to, to uh, talking about um, and having you guys play around with some stuff. From about 1993 to 2010, off the west coast of the United States, we've seen about zero sea level rise or even negative sea level rise. So sea level was falling during that time period. But since about 2010, 2011, we've seen this really rapid increase in sea level off the U.S. west coast. We're seeing this recovery back towards the global mean. And if this continues to increase, then you would expect to start to see sea level impacts associated with this increase. Increased coastal erosion, increased high tide flooding, these kinds of things as sea level continues to increase. So there's a number of things happening. One is there's this background increase in sea level associated with global warming, so thermal expansion, and the melting of ice, which is impacting sea level along the west coast. That's causing this long-term increase. But on top of that increase, there's this oscillation that occurs, and actually a number of oscillations. So the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is one of those. The El Nino Southern Oscillation is another. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is a large-scale climate signal centered in the Pacific Ocean. Every 10 years, we see this shift in the sea level between what we see in the Western Pacific and what we see in the Eastern Pacific. And these oscillations suppress or elevate sea level over different time periods and really either exacerbate or diminish the effects of that long-term sea level. Since about 2010, 2011, we've been seeing this uh, shift in that decadal variability associated with the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And what that's doing is causing sea level along the west coast of the US to go up. high rates of sea level, causing sea level to shift very dramatically in, in this increase that we've been seeing in the satellite records and also in some of the tide gauge records along the U.S. coast as well. Sea level is going to change and how it's going to impact the coast I think is really important so we can inform people, they can make good decisions for their future, and we can start to adapt and adjust our way of living in order to account for these effects that are going to occur in the future. Okay, so uh, what are we seeing here in terms of uh, coastal flooding in California? We're seeing uh, more and more road closures. Uh, we just had a PCH closed on the Big Sur coastline for yet another um, landslide, yet another um, um, issue associated in that case, fostered by wildfire and associated debris flows. But um, road closures are potentially a huge problem. Um, they, they range from inconvenience to huge problem. We're seeing a lot of our um, coastal infrastructure potentially overwhelmed. So the example I think of a lot is uh, at Magoo Lagoon, um, our, our naval base, naval base Ventura County. Um, the, one of the main values of that particular base is, is the, are the runways. And the runways can be mocked up to look like aircraft carriers. So it's one of the places that um, the uh, 
fighter pilots practice landing um, you know, at night and fog, all this kind of stuff on an aircraft carrier, but they're doing it um, you know, on land in a bit safer condition. Uh, so you can imagine that's important for national security, all this and that. The controls, the electrical um, box, basically, that controls the lights and that kind of stuff, is at the end of the runway between the runway and the beach. And the runway almost ends at the beach. Uh, and that area has flooded several times and required the, the rebuilding, the, the um, rehabilitating of that electrical system several times a small thing, but when it keeps happening over and over again, for just one small piece of infrastructure, you know, we've spent tens of millions of dollars on this in the last few years. Then when we talk about things like sewer systems, stormwater systems, um, telecommunication systems, these things are also at risk. Uh, general damage to transportation infrastructure. Uh, we see this a lot with our coastal uh, erosion and coastal flooding um, in California, particularly with our uh, passenger rail service and our cargo rail service in the coastal zone um, with Amtrak, et cetera. Um, and then we just have the outright coastal erosion where we see the, um, uh, and th th this captures, I think, most of the public attention where we have a big fancy mansion or something that's exposed to flooding and uh, oh my gosh these folks want to do something so they ask for a permit to armor the coast. Armoring the coast, pouring hard fixed structures is a huge problem. It's exactly analogous to levying our rivers and as we talked about with our flooding, uh, our riparian flooding, by armoring you know, by, by making a levee on the river, we're containing the flows in the river and we're actually increasing the speed of the water, increasing the damage of the flooding downstream. Same exact analogy when we talk about armoring the shoreline. We're simply transferring the energy to another part of the beach that's not armored. Um, it also will have the effect of removing the beach. Um, and, and scouring out the beach. And so we lose the aesthetics, we lose the ecological functioning, we lose the recreational opportunities, all that kind of stuff. And um, most of these engineered structures do not last for very long. So they, they are a, a short-term solution at best. Um, uh, now this is gonna be dependent and you guys are gonna play with this in a second, but th this is, um, uh, these next risks here are going to be dependent upon what level of flooding we're talking about. Are we talking about that meter or so rise of sea level, or are we talking about that, that two meters of sea level rise? But using the traditional uh, you know, meter, meter and a half uh, estimates by 2100, we're talking at least 200,000 people um, living on the immediate coastal fringe uh, and therefore their homes exposed to coastal flooding or will be exposed, exposed to coastal flooding in the coming decades. That's a lot of people. Um, 873 miles of coastal roads um, will be damaged or inundated or not workable. Um, we currently are using a very slow system to respond to this. So we're currently using the traditional Endangered Species Act, environmental uh, uh, EIR type of approaches. So one of the road segments that we um, visit in my coastal class up in San Luis Obispo County, um, it's taken them over 20 years and on the order of $70 million to deal with two miles, or a little bit over two miles of PCH that was, that was moved inland because it was eroding into the ocean. And with 873 miles, that's that becomes very expensive very fast, even if we're only talking about the roadbed itself and not any other utilities or anything like that. Um, uh, we are a coastal, uh, our, our state is heavily reliant on the ocean or marine economy or so-called blue economy. So shipping, international trade, travel, et cetera. So all of our ports and harbors need working functioning areas. And as those areas become flooded and inundated, that has all kinds of problems. As the roads that bring uh, trucks and, and, and cargo uh, containers to and from the ports become flooded or inundated, that causes problems, et cetera. So there's huge potential disruptions in the order of billions of dollars a year 
um, to be had on our uh, uh, economy if we don't deal with this coastal flooding. And then knock on effects in terms of lost work, in terms of people have to stay home to bail out, get the water out of their homes as opposed to, um, you know, doing their normal jobs, all those kinds of things. And we can go on and on, but you guys get the, get the point. Um, uh, totally happy to answer questions, but the next thing I want to do is have you guys play with a little stuff. How are we doing on time here? Okay, cool. So I want you guys to, to, to play with a couple of these viewers. So here I'm show, I'll, I'll put these in the chat in a second. So these are three different viewers that are all essentially doing the same thing. These are taking, um, so just like we had the question a few minutes ago about, hey, how do we know what areas are gonna flood during the, the hurricane or whatever? We have topographic maps, or if you guys have taken GIS, uh, 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 geospatial maps that have DEMS, digital elevation models in them. So for every pixel, every unit in that, um, map, we know the relative elevation. And then we can just say, ah, okay, if it's, if it's uh, you know, half a meter above sea level, what happens if we get a meter of, of storm surge or a meter of sea level rise or what have you? And we can then predict where we think the water level is going to be. So uh, I have a NOAA version, which is the federal government's uh, uh, tool viewer. Um, and then I have a version from the Nature Conservancy that, um, that I and some other people helped craft uh, several years ago now. It's, I feel very old. Um, uh, and and uh, the, the NOAA is a national. You can look at things across the nation. Nature Conservancy, um, we were the first one on the West Coast. Ventura County was the first one on the West Coast to do this, but now we have a few other points. But I, I want you guys to, to play with Ventura County. And then Climate Central, which is a, a news organization. Um, and, and so as we go from NOAA to Nature Conservancy to Climate Central, um, I would say the tools get a little bit more sophisticated. The general approach is the same, but we've sort of learned with each, each sort of iteration of, of generating these types of tools, how to make them more useful and so how to layer in more, um, more layers and therefore more um, allows you to do more what if type scenarios. So, um, Maybe what we'll do is, is we're almost up against the break. So I will copy these. I'm gonna put these in the chat and then um, uh, we'll take, we'll reconvene in about 20 minutes. So you guys take a 10 minute break and I want you to spend about 10 minutes playing around with these. And so what you'll see from these tools is you'll, you'll click on them and, and you'll, you'll um, either type in an address or, or, or zoom to an area. In some cases, when you're zoomed really far out, the, the, uh, the GIS won't visualize properly. So if you're zoomed way out and you don't see anything, you can just zoom in a, a tick or two and then you'll, you'll probably see the, the data layers. They're not always turned on. They are of course available. So if you're starting to see colors and polygons in, your, in the coastline, you're not sure what they are, go ahead and click on the upper left or upper right and there will be a legend and you can explore stuff. And so basically what I want you to do in that 10 minutes when you're playing with this is just is, um, you can go ahead and pick one of these. You don't have to do all three necessarily, but, but pick one or one or two of these and, uh, and with your browser, go on, uh, turn it on and just look around the Ventura County coast. And I want you to, to tell me uh, what areas seem to be most vulnerable to coastal flooding and um, uh, areas that you think maybe we could, um, uh, or, or what responses, what management responses you can envision to figure out how we could reduce the flooding in at least some of the areas of uh, the Ventura County coastline. If you wanna look down to LA, you're welcome to, you wanna look up to Santa Barbara, you're welcome, but start on the Ventura County coast. Cool? So give me one second here. I'm gonna throw these in the chat. I'm going to uh, stop sharing. I'm gonna throw these in the chat. Can you guys hear my chickens laying eggs? <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, okay, so you guys can see me, right? So you can see, so this is the, the NOAA sea level uh, rise viewer one, right? So if I crank this up to seven feet. Um, 
So the key thing is this is the water. Um, this is the water uh, level, right? Or excuse me, the, uh, the, uh, the, the high tide level, high tide level. So the first thing you see when we do this is basically the, the naval base is gone. Um, so when we talk about coastal flooding, let me take this down a little bit. When we talk about coastal flooding. Um, so this, you know, still relatively, you know, compared to what we have left, this is still a very important coastal wetland, Magoo, Magoo Lagoon is. Um, what we essentially did in the wake of World War II, so this was used as a training base in World War II, we, we, we scooped out sediment from here, this part of the, um, so this is Cayugas Creek that goes by campus and everything dumps out here. We scooped out this soil enough so that we could dump that, that sediment in the rest of the base for where the airfields are here and these sort of main, main you know, building areas, landward, landward area, to raise that three to four meters. So you know, very high, we scooped out a lot of sediment. And, and because of bad sediment management practices in the ensuing decades, most of this sediment came back in and filled in. So, so uh, and then there's a big submarine canyon off here, which, which absorbs all the sediment, it goes to the deeper ocean. Um, uh, so, uh, so right now it's good, but as we start to go higher, as we go to even just the, the three foot, the three foot things are kind of okay, right? Because these things are elevated. So you can see the, the areas to the sides of the, um, of the uh, airstrip, et cetera, and the core, the core of the, the naval facility, the uh, aviation facilities um, are, are gone, but the, the, the core areas persist. But once we go to higher, um, those guys go away. So it is possible that you could you could dump more fill here, and you could you know theoretically raise that um, raise that uh, runway. So that's one thing you can respond to. Excuse me. One way you could deal with the elevations. Uh, here's school. Here's campus, and here's campus right here. So at that at that you know two meter or so elevation, the water is getting closer to campus. It's not quite to campus. But remember, this is this is mean higher high water. So this is not with storm surge. So then when you bring on a hurricane or a, or a big winter storm or whatever, um, right here, right now, we have sort of a, a, a mini cliff, right? There's, 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 there's boulders and there's beaches and dunes and stuff. So those waves, boom, hit the, hit the beach right there or hit, or hit uh, the, sand, the toe of the Santa Monica Mountains. Up here, once once we jump those barriers, there's there is no there is no you know uh, a dune system or anything like that. So it's much easier. This is flat land. It's much easier for for tidal surge or storm surge to just run inland. And so we're getting close. And as we go to you know about ten feet, we're getting even closer. And and all it takes is a couple of good storms to push that flood water onto, onto campus. So it looks like it's still pretty far away, but this is really flat ground here, right? This is plus 10 feet. Campus is about 14 feet above, above uh, currently above sea level. And so, so we're kind of okay, but we're, we're getting close to being inundated, right? And, and we're a classic example. We are a state agency. There's no money to, to I mean, it's, it's challenging enough for a private business. Let's say if you had an apartment complex or something to, to go to a, um, the bank and get a loan to, to do, do something. But with the state, we, I mean, we can't, right? We have to have special permission. We have to raise a bond. We have to, so, and, and there's our public infrastructure. There's the, there's the, um, uh, you know, airfield public infrastructure, there's the sewage system public infrastructure, there's all kinds of things that will be competing for those types of money. So, so um, it's, it's a non-trivial thing to deal with this flooding. So, um, so, okay, so, so what we talk about, so one option is to just dump like they, like they want to do in Florida, we just need to raise the road bed. Um, that's something you could try, I suppose. So you could, you could physically raise where your building is or raise where your infrastructure is. What are some other responses we can take to coastal flooding to deal with, to mitigate coastal flooding risk? Don't we use sandbags? Like, I mean, for kind of mild. Flooding, yeah, we can, I guess? 
Yeah, we could we could make essentially a barrier, right? Um, so did anybody see uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine? If if you saw that movie, there's scenes of of the the characters flying from LA and they fly along the LA coast and it's just a huge giant massive monolithic wall that the ocean breaks against right so in theory theoretically we can do that here in the Oxnard plain we're never going to be able to do that. That, that that that's just way too gazillion million dollars expensive however if we go to some places like uh, Carpinteria is also pretty much screwed um, but and and much of Goleta is probably screwed. But in places like Santa Barbara, very high value, high value real estate, high value businesses, all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> and whereas the Oxnard Plain, the whole area is super flat, right? You'd have to build, I don't know, twenty miles of wall, right? That's that's not going to happen. In downtown Santa Barbara. I'm not saying we should do this, but at least there's the possibility. Have a look, right? So we're kind of we have this sort of valley, this this small gap. <clears throat> and while it would also be insanely expensive, at least into the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, you could potentially do that, right? You could potentially put some type of flood control barrier here, and and only have to go from from here to here, and essentially seal off. Uh, the the downtown area, which is the big economic engine, that's where all the tourists come to have dinner and 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 hotels and that kind of stuff. So there are, are some parts of the coast where you could potentially think of of taking an active defense, as it were. But in much of the coast, that's just unrealistic, right? I mean, it's just it's just too expensive, too too hard. Um, to, you know, it's it's just it's it's not going to happen. Um, and so in those places like uh, uh, Carpinteria, we're essentially left with either, uh, you know, dumping stuff to raise the roads, not the whole area, but maybe a few elements of, of key coastal infrastructure, or manage retreat, or backing away, or taking that power plant <clears throat> that's here and moving it in here, or something of that nature. Can you guys think of other responses that we could take to deal with a coastal flood risk other than raising the elevation or putting a, a barrier or 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 backing away from the ocean? Um, on the coast of like North Carolina and like South Carolina, just like like little islands to protect it against hurricanes, right? Barrier um, islands, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm thinking doing something like that too. Um, but like further away so that um, I know they're for hurricanes, right? But at the mm -hmm. same time, they could be used in case like upwelling, like yeah. for example, you know how China is doing and like upwelling island, like sediments from the bottom creating right. artificial islands. Yeah, great idea. Great thought. The problem is that probably won't work for us, Ollie, because um, it's a great idea. But in so when you go to North Carolina and you take a rock and you go stand on the beach and you throw that rock as far as you can and it goes choo 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 plop and it lands in the water and it's going to sink and it's going to go to i don't know two foot three foot depth of water you go to magoo lagoon oxnard carpinteria you take that same exact rock huck it and it hits the water and it sinks it might be in a hundred feet of water so our coasts are much more up and down so to put in something like that, it's a great idea. But to put in a an island or a or a or a you know a speed bump, as it were, you would have to essentially build skyscrapers in the ocean, um, and so it doesn't really work. Whereas in those places, uh, uh, Florida coast, Louisiana coast, Texas, Carolinas, it's very very flat, and so you can actually dump sand and create those islands. So those places where China is doing that or places in the, the you know, uh, Arabian Sea or whatever, Red Sea, where they're doing that, it's, it tends to be very, very shallow uh, depths. And so it's relatively easy to dump a certain volume of sand and have that sand stay there. And just like you're building a sand castle, you know, sort of raise up the, the elevation. I see. It, that makes more sense because um, 
no how how, how you can pile like a hundred feet of um sand just to for it for minimal you know relief and for so much money i thank yeah you totally totally other thoughts anybody else have any other other guesses or or, or suggestions for dealing with um dealing with uh uh coastal flood risk could you do um like artificial reefs or tree lines i mean all of that seems like silly like band-aids on the problem but uh sure but it might buy you some time it might buy you some time so yeah so so uh, uh kelp beds absolutely could potentially uh help slow down some of the storm surge it's not going to solve your problem you're right but it could help so i think all these things you the um all those suggestions are very similar to um um we talked about in the in the early days of the pandemic we talked about flattening the curve right so the idea with flattening the curve we weren't working to stop the pandemic but the idea was that was going to give us time for the the hospitals to ramp up to get their to get their intubators and 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 all their um you know ppe and all that kind of stuff and so that simply slowing the rate of the spread of the virus wasn't going to solve the problem, but it was going to buy us time. And so some of those techniques, like um, like some floating things, groins maybe to, uh, you know, put out in front of the beaches or something of that nature, uh, jetties and things, um, they won't stop the sea level from rising, but they might buy us another decade or two, right? And I think as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, um, uh, you know, we hear something, you know, well, let's imagine a year ago, right? Let's imagine a year ago and a year ago it was, oh crap, you know, we're going to, we might be here for a long time. And you're hearing people say we might be here for months. And I'll speak for myself. I was thinking months, what the hell months in the house? Are you crazy? And now we've, we've all been in the house for a year. Right. And, and Fauci and, and folks are saying, well, probably by next Christmas we might be able to get rid of masks, right? So, so it's 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 um, um, it's interesting how our perspectives can change, and it's also and that's one of the the um, hopes with disasters. We don't want to have disasters kill people, break things, all that kind of stuff. But when they do happen, they afford us opportunities to rethink about stuff. So if we have some of these jetties or some of these uh, uh, things to buy us a little bit of time. Maybe when we have a disaster, we can go ahead and 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 uh, adapt, or we can go ahead and 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 take the the measures that we we want to take to avoid uh, uh, the worst of the worst, and to sort of get out of harm's way as as, as much as possible. Um, you know, I mean, so one of the the great examples of the people talk about around the world actually i can't believe how many people know about ventura county but if we look right here okay so here's the let me let me take this down so we have um uh this managed retreat of surfers point right here So this was an area, a crumbling boardwalk, uh, you know, so it wasn't safe to walk on, dangerous, wasn't useful for recreation, um, and was being undercut. The waves are coming here, bang, 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 and, and cutting it out. And so, so you couldn't easily get down to the water because it was a, you know, like a five, six, 10 foot drop. Um, so unsafe, unsightly, not helpful. And about uh, a decade or so ago now, what we did was we took that pathway that was out about here and we moved it into its current location. So we did a new, uh, uh, you know, new bike path. We lost some of the parking at the county fair, but it was, it was you know, I forget, less than 100 parking spots or so. So it was some, but we had still have a huge amount of parking. So we, we did lose a few things, but we got a new parking lot. And then in between here, in between that uh, new um, uh, strand, that new bike path, we did a dune restoration, right? So we restored this area. So we added the biological diversity. We added the physical infrastructure that acted as a buffer. And now it's way better. So now it's 
way more people use it, walk their dogs, skateboard, rollerblade, whatever on it. It's safe. It's enjoyable. And we're no longer in, in danger of waves breaking over and, and, and flooding the parking lot and all that kind of stuff. So we can do managed retreat correctly, but most folks currently in California are fighting it. And so one of the uh, one or two of the articles I've given you, LA Times articles, we, 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 we touch on this. This is absolutely the way we're going to have to respond to sea level rise. There's, there's just no other way. Now, whether we respond by retreating next year or 25 years from now or 50 years from now is up to us. It's actually way cheaper to move earlier, move our infrastructure, move our people, et cetera. Um, it's, it's one thing to, to deal with this. So here we have you know, state parks, we have public land. It's one thing when we have public infrastructure, public property, it's another when we have private property. And so the, um, you know, uh, how, do, how do we deal with that? Do we, do we use eminent domain? Do we take someone's property or what have you? Um, what's going on now with tools like the ones you guys are playing around with, these are putting in, and you know, these are relatively new tools. They've only been around for a couple of years, a uh, few years so far. Um, they are allowing people, homeowners, renters, to say, hey, might my home flood? And to start to answer the question. And the same thing with wildfire risk and all these other risks we talk about in disaster. Um, the first step is, is offering up the information, right? The knowledge that this is a potential threat or danger. The hope is once people see this, people will say, oh man, I'm gonna move out of my house here and I'm gonna go buy a house over here or something of that nature. The question is gonna be, um, uh, what are some of the unintended consequences of that? So one, um, when are you gonna move? So, so uh, I'm, re I'm recording this, so I have to be careful what I say, but I'll say that um, I know several people who, uh, were professors in Florida or are professors in Florida that used to own a home in coastal Florida. Uh, none of them own a home in Florida anymore. So they've all sold their homes and, or, or almost all of them have sold their homes and they are renting a home now, right? And so they saw the writing on the wall and they said, hey man, this is gonna be bad. So the poster child for dealing with flood risk Let's look at uh, let's look at uh, Miami. So here's Miami. Check this out. This is eight feet, right? But but let's just do our, our simple, basic three foot assumption. Lots of areas here green. Lots of areas here blue. If we go up to the more realistic, uh, you know, ones, we start to see you know, essentially the entirety of these barrier islands are inundated on Miami Beach, et cetera. And much of the, of the um, um, immediate shoreline, let's, let's zoom in a little bit more. Much of the immediate shoreline is, is gonzo. So, um, so they will also probably lose their fresh water. They're probably not, not really, uh, able to supply fresh water before this happens because as the sea level is coming in seawater is also intruding and contaminating the freshwater aquifers that people that the, the municipalities use for um, water supply for the area but um, I suspect this is going to be one of the places um, that is going to be the poster child for scaring the rest of the country into dealing with with coastal flood risk and sea level rise so I think, and a lot of people think, this is how this is going to play out. So if we look at these, you know, um, um, uh, what's the famous beach? Not North Beach, but um, um, whatever the heck beach uh, in Miami there where all the, all the fashionistas hang out. Um, uh, um, lots, of, lots of high rises, lots of, you know, fancy condos and high end, all this kind of, you know, Rodeo Drive kind of stuff. Um, turns out a large fraction of those high rise um, living establishments 
are actually not occupied by anyone. Most of the population lives in regular, you know, one, two-story buildings around uh, this part of, of Broward County, part of Miami. Um, and so, uh, but yet the city gets a lot of tax base from these things. So these are mostly investment vehicles, these high-end um, apartments in, in these high-end condos and, and uh, such. So it turns out there are a lot of investment from South America, from Russian oligarchs, that kind of stuff, right? So they're parked in the U.S. because they're considered to be a, a, a solid uh, way to protect your money. At some point, when the sunny day flooding gets to the point where it's just so ridiculous, you can't even get into the building because it's flooding that much because of sea level rise and, and all these other issues. Um, at some point, these investors, which only own these properties as a, as a or primarily own them as a financial vehicle, are going to say, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm going to sell my condo and I'm going to go buy something in New York or I'm going to go buy something in London or, or whatever, right? This is not how I behave. I don't have the money to do this, but this is what, right? And this is a huge amount of the tax base of, of the city of Miami and, and, and related municipalities. So at some point, these guys are going to start selling and that guy's going to sell and then she's going to sell and then she's going to sell and then he's going to sell. And I suspect over a very short amount of time, maybe six months, the, the value of those, uh, you know, condos, which are a million dollars, two million dollars a piece are going to start to tank. And once everybody else in the building starts to see they're starting to tank because they're an investment vehicle, they're not living there for 50 years with their kids, they're going to sell those. And boom, they sell those, sell those suckers. And then, and then all of a sudden the real estate market will implode. And already Miami, Miami is, is struggling with how to deal with sea level rise, even though it has all of its current resources. As we get more and more into this crazy sea level rise um, and you start to lose your tax base as those individuals migrate away, you have less ability to build barriers, raise road beds, whatever it's going to be. And so your ability to respond goes down. And so it's very likely that there's going to be some kind of, I don't mean to be mean, but some type of death spiral that's going to happen to some cities in the U.S. And Miami seems to be the classic, unfortunately, um, the most likely uh, uh, candidate for that. And as Miami goes subtitle or as Miami implodes, that will freak out the rest of the U.S., right? This could also happen to Virginia. There's other places where this could, could well happen. But we're as bad as it, as bad as we are in California, and we're pretty bad, right? Um, the San Francisco Bay Area is pretty vulnerable. San Diego is pretty vulnerable. But most of the rest of the coast is, it, it's going to be bad everywhere, but it's not going to necessarily end everything. Whereas here in places like these, these very flat areas, this coastal flooding could well be the death knell for for or, or at least a, a major, major reorganization of the town and counties and everything. And so I think that's going to be the, the shocker that, that, that induces people to start to behave differently or, or respond to um, the coastal inundation threats differently. But, um, but yeah, we'll see. But when, is that going to happen next year? Is that going to happen next week? Is that going to happen 10 years, 20 years? It, it's hard to know, right? But it, it's pretty clear that that um, areas like coastal Miami are on uh, borrowed time. And it's very difficult, unfortunately, to envision a scenario where, where everybody gets out of this with uh, you know intact kind of thing. What else? Did you guys notice any other, any other observations when you were playing around with your, with your coastal sea level rise viewers? Um, what's it called? Um, what it seems like the most affected area is probably around the Gulf of Mexico. So from Texas all the way to Florida on all those, like, you know, um, right. Louisiana, Alabama, right. all those, the, that area seems like it's, it's just going downhill from there, right? Yeah. So, um, and looking at North Carolina too, so like stretching from there to the East Coast, Yeah. I don't see California being as much effective as these places are. So just talking about it and because, um, they're like this term climate refugees they are going to be like climate refugees now because looking at all these places uh all these lost um first of all there's going to be less money 
that means they're going to be like less property value, less farms, less everything. But at the same time, people are fleeing, right? So it's kind of like, like you said, like, it, and Sabrina also said, we're just putting like a Band-Aid on like the true problem, right? That eventually it's going to get too far for us to handle and just shocking, just like seeing like almost half of Louisiana underwater. It's just absolutely mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, and so I encourage you guys. So next year, um, uh, I'm optimistic that we're going to be allowed to go. We're not going to, I don't think we're going to be allowed to do international trips next year um, because COVID is still going to be around in other countries and, and this and that. But um, I'm optimistic that our New Orleans class will be going. If you guys are interested, you should come with us to New Orleans and see some of this stuff uh, firsthand. And we're, we're involved, our stuff in, um, so Ali is right in that Louisiana is hurting, right? So we're basically, this is the Mississippi River right here. And essentially, um, we're, it's, it's hard to envision how we're going to say. So this, this light blue stuff is all existing salt marsh, right? And so in wetlands. So this is, this is basically um, what we're going to be left with. This is the city of New Orleans, primarily here because it is behind levees. So we work, we work down here in the, in the boot tip uh, of um, Beerus, a town called Beerus, Louisiana. And then we do a lot of work. In fact, I have, uh, my, my colleague is angry with me. I have to, as soon as class is over, I have to respond to an email to get back to her with something. But, but so this is uh, Bell Chase. This is English Turn. This is where we're working on restoring Cypress Swamp. And we've been working on this with, with uh, you know, me, with your, with colleagues from other universities, and with your fellow students for the last, um, I don't know what, seven, 16 years or, or so. Um, and so, so we have, we have an, uh, our partner NGO has been acquiring land and we've been working on actively getting rid of non-native species that compete with the natives, planting natives, et cetera. And so um, you're right, we can't, we, we, we probably can't do much for, for this chunk right out here, but for these parts that we can save, we, we, we can maybe do some good. And so, um, so uh, yeah, that's the whole conversation for a different class, but, but how we respond to this and the social justice and environmental justice aspect of this cannot be under, understated. So here is, I don't wanna get, get I'll, I'll, I'll get on my high horse if I start talking to him, but I'll just say one little quick factoid. Here, this is the uh, state of Louisiana. The, when Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, the only school district in the entire state of Louisiana that had uh, hurricane and flood insurance was Plaquemine Parish. Was was they don't have counties, they have parishes, but but uh, the schools in this area where we work, everywhere else did not have insurance to deal with you know hurricane flooding. The last school district that was allowed to rebuild and that was able to rebuild was this school district. So, um, so uh, basically because of politics, basically because um, this is very hard to defend. The only reason why this, why this road is still here, this is a very narrow road. If you guys come with me, you'll see it. Um, this is a, a highway that goes down here. This is the Mississippi River. So there's a highway between this part that's not blue this part that's not blue, there's a levee on the Mississippi, and there's a levee on the Gulf of Mexico, and the freeway goes right down the middle of it. And it parts of it, it's like here, it's about a quarter mile wide. It's very, very narrow. And you go down for, you know, this is from, from New Orleans down to here is about an hour drive, right? So this is a long drive, you know, going freeway speeds all the way down. This exists because of the Port of Venice. This is where river uh, boat pilots, when they go to um, New Orleans, um, this is where they get on the tankers and where they get off the tankers. And then this is where the oil and gas industry launches boats and helicopters to go out to the platforms to do their oil drilling and stuff. It's not because of the people here, right? There's people that live here, there's people that live here, there's people that live here, there's people that live here. Um, these folks have basically been written off by their government. And these are not affluent people. These are folks that have lived here for generations. And with so many of our other disasters that we're seeing, wildfires, uh, other, other challenges, um, 
I think there's a strong moral component to this. There's all the science that we normally work on, which is, which is important, but there's all, we also have to ask ourselves, is it fair to allow certain people to just be cast off? Obviously, if you didn't have these flood models, and it's sort of hard to understand, but as we're coming to understand the true risk posed by climate change and our, our human choices, our development choices, I think we have to ask ourselves, is it, is it okay to just simply say, you're on your own, right? Um, when, we, when our society as a whole has set up these systems, have set up these, um, the infrastructure and encourage people to, to do certain activities and, and, and live in certain places and have their businesses in certain places, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy answer. But oftentimes I find that um, I've been disappointed with some of the leadership, our political leaders, in terms of being able to um, address these challenges uh, head first. And so um, nobody's doing a fantastic job of it, but there are places that are doing better and places that are doing worse in terms of managing these risks. And so while we might be okay, relatively okay, it's still gonna be you know, billions and billions and billions and billions and trillions of dollars to deal with, with the coastal flooding. But remember, we also have wildfire risks to deal with. And so while we might be okay on one of these risks, the other ones were, were much more, um, are much more problematic. So, so yeah, so I, I don't try to, I mean, I, this became a bummed out conference lecture. I wasn't trying to make us have a bummed out lecture, but, but any other- uh, What class is it that goes to New Orleans? It's called ESRM 492. It's called Service Learning in New Orleans. It's a three unit class. It's open to anybody on campus. And um, it's a spring class, so it'll be next spring. So the, the app, there's an application because there's usually more people apply that um, that want to go than we have slots for. Uh, uh, I don't know what's going to happen next year, so I'm, I'm I don't know how many other classes are going to go. So there might be a lot of people want to go. So normally I, I um, used to take a lot of people, and then I drop down for reasons we can talk about uh, to just taking 12 people a year. But I think next year I'm going to try to take more like 20 because we haven't been able to go these last two years. Um, and so, uh, so there's an application period around um, Halloween time. And then uh, I'll let you guys know so that when, when spring class signups come around, you can apply. And then um, uh, we, it's a class that so we have like lectures and stuff. And then we essentially spend all of spring break. We live a little teeny bit before spring break. and We come back a little teeny bit after spring break. Um, and we spend, uh, you know, about uh, 10, 12 days in New Orleans. It costs you guys, I don't know, I don't know what the airfare is going to be, but historically it costs you guys about 700 bucks and school pays all the rest of the cost. That's airfare, food, room and board, everything. So it's a pretty- Are the applications like merit-based or first come, first serve? It's a little bit of both. It's, it's more like, why do you want to go, basically? Gotcha. So it's, yeah. So um, historically ESRM is the largest number of students ago just because you guys are usually the most interested in doing it but you know we'll have nursing students or business students or, or art students so yeah if you guys are interested check it out and and uh it has to be funded so i apply for it we use our, our ira funds so the funds you guys pay into every year so it's a, it's a competition so we're the only class well we didn't go the last two years because of covid but but except for the last two years we're the only class that's actually had a trip every single year and has been funded so we're kind of we're kind of one of the flagship uh, trips. Most people do the trip every other year or something like that, um, and and most of the other trips do kind of more tourism, touristy, uh, touristy kind of stuff. But our ESRM trips and especially this New Orleans trip, it's really about service. So we we install food gardens in in food deserts and we do uh, swamp surveys. And then most nights I take you guys out to different jazz clubs, Zydeco clubs. We do the history of Louisiana through food with some chef friends of ours. Um, we meet with the mayor, meet with reporters. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a pretty awesome class. I'm very proud of it. So um, yeah, if you guys are even vaguely interested, I would encourage you to consider, um, consider doing it. And you can use it as a, as a three unit upper division elective. So for us, for ESRM. Okay, cool. So I've been rambling on. This is a good conversation, you guys. Um, any other last observations you guys made when you're playing around with any this viewer or any of the other viewers or any insights you wanted to share? Okay, cool. I wonder how things like this will reshape like our federal government, like if parts of Florida become totally obsolete, you know, will it reshape our House of Representatives and stuff like that if there aren't 
the need for people who represent that land anymore. It absolutely will. It absolutely will. And I think that's that. Uh, yes, I think it absolutely will. <laughs> um, uh, no question. Um, uh, there are so many changes that are coming along, brought about by disasters and and the risks associated with them. It's 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 almost hard to wrap our heads around how how different things will be. I mean, if we just imagine a year ago versus now, just with COVID, and how like could we have, have envisioned, you know, ordering all our food online or 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 never seeing our friends or whatever? And that's a relatively understandable, relatively well predicted. Like we knew this this has been modeled for years and years. The the federal administration. Um, chose to not look at those reports and things of that nature, but, but, um, but at least it was sort of conceptualized. Some of this flooding, this coastal flooding, we obviously understand, yes, the water's gonna come high and it's gonna go into this house and it's gonna flood this power plant or something. But as to those comments that, that you guys are talking about, oh, what, what, what's the knock-on effect of the knock-on effect of the knock-on effect, then we start getting into science fiction territory, literally about, you know, we need, creative people to start to think, whoa, if that happens, well, what happens here, right? Changing political alliances, changing economic alignments, um, um, changing transportation corridors, all these things are, 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 may well happen. And so, so our goal, your goal, as, as you guys graduate from this class, I know we're, it's a spring break, it's not the end of the semester, it's <laughs> spring break, but, um, you know, the, the onus is really on you guys, right? You guys are, you know, I, we tend to think of ourselves as, oh, you know, we don't have much money. We're not going to that fancy school and this and that, you know, screw that. You guys are all incredibly rare and incredibly precious. You are a very small fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the humans that ever lived on earth that have the luxury to look at these kinds of maps and the knowledge to understand this. So, so you are, once you now, but also when you graduate, you all are the ones that, are, that have the knowledge. And so when your crazy uncle says something like, oh, that sea level rise is all BS, or there's some public debate and people start saying things like, you know, I don't know, it's pretty expensive to move the road. I don't think we should do that, right? You need to be the voices of reason here that say, I totally get it. Yes, it seems scary. Yes, it's it of course is going to be expensive to move that road. But what's the alternative, right? What's the business is normal alternative? Well, that's going to be to have the road totally washed away and the hospital gone and us having to build the road over the course of a month, you know, as, as an emergency repair thing, which will be way more expensive, won't be as good, right? So you guys need to be armed with the facts and in, one and two engage in these conversations with informally with friends and family formally with co-workers and and you know pub in the public forum and and that's how we're going to get through this is by by um going forward and it doesn't have to be scary right parts of this are really scary but also once we know we can say screw it Got it. We don't want to have the scary end of the world zombie apocalypse part. We want to have this part. So let's move this way. Let, let's change our, our you know, um, the carbon intensity of our economy. Let's change how we're doing coastal development. Let's change how we're doing, uh, you know, building for wildfires, all that kind of stuff. And so it need not be freaking us out all the time or depressing us. You guys will be armed with the knowledge and you guys can can let, lead us into the, the new cool future. I'm so stoked you guys are gonna save us all. It's great, it's great. Okay, well, uh, with that, we're, we're out of time. Um, so I just wanna end by saying really quickly that, um, uh, so the, uh, I, I added a new module, which is our um, uh, disaster case studies. Most groups gave me their, their uh, candidate uh, sites for disaster for, for their disaster case studies. And I, I uh, set up groups and responded to everybody via those groups, via announcements to each of those groups. So you guys should have all gotten the uh, little announcement thing. Um, if you've not given me your, you, or you haven't gotten with your partner and you've not given me your uh, suggested targets, please do that and, and get them to me. Um, and then uh, we have this one 
uh, module and that's gonna, the module is gonna go for several weeks, right? So rather than the typically we've had a module that goes on and goes off, this one's gonna stay and I'm just gonna be adding in each week different um, uh, tasks. And so we'll start with the first one. It's just gonna be a first draft this first week, take a stab at it, work on it. I'll give you feedback and we'll go back and forth. And then once we get the first one done and everybody's sort of more comfortable with what we're looking for, then we'll move on to our other ones. Um, but the thing I want to just remind you guys is when, we, when you do turn that stuff in, um, you always turn in a complete draft. So even, I even though I have the term draft in there, draft doesn't mean a, a bullet and some random words, right? It means, it means you guys do craft a, a, um, uh, a case study. And I totally get that you're going to revise it and change it, whatever, but, but don't, don't half-ass it, right? So, so whenever you guys turn something in, put all your effort into it, references, et cetera. And uh, with that, we're out of time. So I'm gonna kill this. I'll hang out if you guys have questions, wanna ask about this or the disaster stuff or, or anything else. And uh, um, we have this assignment. You guys will work on this till the end of the week. For spring break, I want everybody to just take the week off, right? So um, we're all super exhausted. You all need to be off Zoom for a few days. So do please take a break, ride a bike, socially distanced, uh, sit in the backyard, socially distanced, um, and, and, and get healthy. And I'll see everybody again after spring break. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.